Hello, welcome. My name is Asahel. I'm a student here in Heartland College. Today's speaker will be Pastor Norberto Restrepo, and he'll be talking about lessons from the past because you're the Walden Seas. Hope you're blessed. Lessons from the past. One of the things I was personally meditating upon was when Jesus chose his disciples and he trained them during three and a half years approximately, he started sharing with them the scenes of his trial and crucifixion and early on, and they would hear, yet they would not really understand. Even the night before all these events, he was in a special way trying to prepare their hearts and praying for them, and nonetheless, they were not prepared. And these were a select group that Jesus himself chose the majority of them. We know that Judas introduced himself. If the disciples had that surprising shock when the events that had been foretold actually enveloped, how do you think? What do you think is going to be our experience today when the final events <coughs> unfold? We, we feel pretty smug that we're ready for them. And... Um, I think that the disciples' history is a good illustration of the best scenario we have. Uh, and that means that they made it through it, but they were startled. They were, it took them by surprise in the sense that it was beyond what they were expecting. So having said that, there are certain groups of people who lived in the past and whose experience they would be worth, it would be worth learning from their experience. And so let's take a look at the Waldenses this morning. Uh, I will start by reading this quotation. In every age there were witnesses for God, men who cherished faith in Christ as the only mediator between God and man, who held the Bible as the only rule of life, and who hallowed the true Sabbath. How much the world owes to these men, posterity will never know. They were branded as heretics their motives impugned, their characters maligned, their writings suppressed, misrepresented, or mutilated. Yet they stood firm, and from age to age maintained their faith in its purity as a sacred heritage for the generations to come. Now the Waldenses were among the first of the peoples of Europe to obtain a translation of the Holy Scriptures into their tongue. And hundreds of years before the Reformation, they possessed the Bible in manuscript. Uh, though gashed by the Savoyard spear and scorched by the Romish faggot, they stood unflinchingly for God's word and his honor. And, and this went on not just for one generation. According to some historians, the history of the Waldenses could extend to even a thousand years uh, of uh, always being among them faithful people. We can't say that 100% a, a of them were faithful. Some of them succumbed to the pressures and compromise, but there is a thread of fidelity for about a thousand years that they did not even, they even kept the Sabbath for many centuries. They preserved that amidst <coughs> hardships that we cannot imagine. In fact, when I read their history and some of the things that they had to undergo, I have to confess, sometimes I just have to stop reading. It's just so horrible that I just, I can't stand reading the descriptions and I just rather not read it and so I just kind of skim through it. Uh, but it just makes you, if you had gone through that, would you still have trusted in God and believed that He's up there and He does care for you? When, when he was allowing these people to be so cruel towards you and your children. It's, but they had an amazing faith. They, most of them never yielded their faith in God. God provided for his people a sanctuary of awful grandeur, befitting the mighty truths committed to their trusts. And it makes me think that you know, God's ideal for educational institutions has been in rural areas. And there is a, a, a purpose for that, and that purpose has many different objectives. Uh, amongst them is to behold the majesty of God's 
nature rather than just contemplating man-made works uh, and other things as practical training and, of course, health reasons uh, as well and the spiritual reasons of being not so in constant contact with temptations and other influences. So they pointed their children to the heights towering above them in unchanging majesty and spoke to them of him with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Kind of similar to John the Baptist, right? Uh, who was also in these circumstances that also had an effect to uh, kind of set in their minds the, the firmness of God's law, his immutability, the immutability of his character and law. In their fidelity to his law, God's servants should be as firm as the unchanging hills. Amen. <clears throat> now, their, the life of these men and women was simple, was pure, fervent. The principles of truth they valued above houses and lands, friends, kindred, even life itself. And these principles they sought to impress earnestly upon the hearts of the young. And yeah, that's, that's quite a question, right? How to impress upon the young these principles. From earliest childhood, the youth were instructed in the scriptures and taught to regard sacredly the claims of the law of God. Now, every parent has his methods. My, my dad, in a special way, he wanted to impress us with the importance of self-sacrifice and, and other principles like that. So he, even, so he brought us up in a pretty austere way, even though my mom is a physician and he had a good position in the church. They only live with, with one salary. The other salary, they, they just saved it 100%. And they only purchased, bought us a pair of shoes once a year. And when we had to travel, they would take us in the worst type of transportation. So airplane was was not an option. In fact, one time we traveled here to the United States and my dad was actually uh, finding out if there was a, a cargo ship that carried bananas that would bring us here to the United States. And I was like, Dad, you're... <laughs> just take an airplane. But it, he just went beyond in his effort to try to teach us a discipline and self-sacrifice. It's kind of difficult in this modern society, you know, uh, but he, he found ways of doing it that at that time I resented because I just, I just saw it as an artificial imposition of unnecessary self-sacrifice. Uh, but I do value his intent because there were some lessons that, uh, uh, that he managed to, to teach me. But it's, it's difficult, right, in our modern society to teach the youth self-sacrifice because it almost comes across as, oh, you're not respecting my rights so it's very challenging today to provide some of these crucial elements that made these missionaries so enduring. So let's uh, move a little bit. The Waldenses had sacrificed their worldly prosperity for truth's sake, and with persevering patience they toiled for their bread. Every spot of tillable land among the mountains was carefully improved. The valleys and the less fertile hillsides were made to yield their increase. Economy and severe self-denial formed a part of the education. Not just self-denial, severe. Severe sounds pretty severe, doesn't it? <laughs> Which the children received as their only legacy. They were taught that God designs life to be a discipline and that their wants could be supplied only by personal labor, forethought, care, and faith. They were taught not just on a whiteboard. They were taught through reality, life. Imagine a college today that would actually implement that. You, know, you might think it's hard and it's a lot of faith to get your tuition and, and the long hours and your church commitments and going back and forth, but just Make the comparison. You go back and forth through your church commitments in a car, a vehicle, not on horseback or maybe just braving those cold winds in those Alps. 
And whatever you try to compare, there's just no point of comparison. There's no point. The process was laborious and wearisome, but it was wholesome. And notice the next phrase, just what man needs in his fallen state. The school which God has provided for his training and development. And now it doesn't speak in past when it gives this last phrase. It, it switches to its present and its future as well. Mm -hmm. The school which God has, doesn't say provided, has provided for his training and development. While the youth were inert to toil and hardship, the culture of the intellect was not neglected. So it was there. Uh, quite amazing. They were taught that all their powers belonged to God and that all were to be improved and developed for His service. Amazing. Because you would think if they were having such a hard time, they were just struggling for survival, what was the point of so much intellectual development? Uh, and if, if this narrative were to fit with the evolutionary uh, uh, history, when people were struggling for survival, civilization did not thrive. They were just surviving. And the arts and intellect, they were neglected. But the Waldenses break with that paradigm. They were struggling for survival, and they were also cultivating the intellect. Uh, their pastors, from their pastors, they received instruction, which for me is a valuable lesson. Their instructors were pious men. It was not just anybody. Mm -hmm. While attention was given to the branches of general learning, the Bible was made the chief study. The Gospels of Matthew and John were committed to memory and many of the epistles. Of course, we have to understand that uh, they had very few copies of the Bible. Very, very few. So if you wanted to study the Bible, you had to resort to what you had memorized. Otherwise, it would be very difficult for you to do personal devotion and open your Bible. There were just very few manuscripts. They were also employed in doing what? Copying the scriptures. Some manuscripts contained the whole Bible, others only brief selections to which some simple explanations of the text were added by those who were able to expound the scriptures. So they also did Bible commentaries. Good exercise. So as you do those commentaries, think the Waldenses were doing this. A good exercise. Uh, um, if you ask the Lord to help you, I, I can imagine that they were very careful in doing this because they were going to give it out to other people. While the Waldenses regarded the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom, they were not blind to the importance of a contact with the world. In other words, they were not just secluded out there, living their pious life, and the, left, the rest of the world will just get lost. No. They were not blind to the importance of a contact with the world, a knowledge of men and of active life in expanding the mind and quickening the perceptions. So from a missionary point of view, they did not neglect the world, and also from a point of view of interaction to expand their own minds. That's... Uh, it's quite, quite a thought. It just kind of makes me think, how were they able to achieve that? From their schools in the mountains, some of the youth were sent to institutions of learning in the cities of France or Italy, where was a more extended field for study, thought, and observation than in their native Alps. So the education they were receiving in the general branches had to be equivalent so that when they went out there, those who were selected they were ready to go to these universities. They were ready to go there intellectually, and they were ready to go there from a point of view of their spiritual character and their principles. They were also ready to go to be missionaries, and they were ready to go being very discreet, because if they were discovered, they would be burned to death, literally. So it was quite a, an education. What if we could achieve that, right? so that when our youth go out, nothing would move them, but at the same time, they would be prudent as they interact and mingle with these other uh, 
segments of society that thought differently from them and definitely they were dealing with the Holy Roman Empire as, as what Europe was called back then. The youth thus sent forth were exposed to temptation. They witnessed vice. They encountered Satan's wily agents who urged upon them the most subtle heresies and the most dangerous deceptions. But their education from childhood had been of a character to prepare them for all of this. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, it just continues uh, sharing some of these uh, wonderful principles that even they receive from their mother's knee um, to be able to do that. So it's, it, it was a work that started very early in their life very early in their life. In fact, uh, higher education or superior education is in the earliest years of your life. Nowadays, we, ca we call higher education post-secondary education, um, and it makes sense in the way it's structured. But from a biblical point of view, higher education is the, the first work that parents do in their homes. And what is the first lesson that children should learn? Obedience, exactly, obedience. Uh, they also learned obedience and submission, but at the same time that they learned obedience and submission, they also learned to be thinkers, to be able to think and act on their own. You know, in God you have these two uh, apparently opposites, but they work together like mercy and justice, also submission and ability to think for yourself how to bring those two together. In our society, if you think and act for yourself, then you're independent, autonomous, rebellious, and subordinate. But in God's creation, it's not supposed to be that way. The more thinking you are, the more submissive, because the greater value you see to submitting to God's holy will. And God's will is what should unite us in unity and truth and in spirit. I, I want to end by reading a quote from Gospel Workers, uh, chapter 53, and this is page 352, which I don't have on the slides. I just uh, read this as an additional thought. May the Lord help everyone to improve to the utmost the talents committed to His trust. May the Lord help everyone to improve to the utmost the talents committed to his trust. Those who work in this cause do not study their Bibles as they should. If they did, its practical teachings would have a positive bearing upon their lives. Whatever your work may be, dear brethren and sisters, do it as for the Master and do your best. Do not overlook present golden opportunities and let your life prove a failure. Do the work that is nearest you. Okay. Do it, even though it may be amid perils and hardships in the missionary field. But do not, I beg of you, complain of hardships and self-sacrifices. Look at the Waldenses. See what plans they devised that the light of the gospel might shine into benighted nights, minds. We should not labor with the expectation of receiving our reward in this life, but with our eyes fixed steadfastly upon the prize at the end of the race. Men and women are wanted now who are as true to duty as the needle to the pole Men and women who will work without having their way smoothed and every obstacle removed. May we be, by God's grace, those men and women.